In the midst of you, there has stood one whom you do know, not, whom you do not know. Words taken from our Holy Gospel today. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we shall consider the virtue of recollection, that habit of paying attention to the presence of God in the soul, is like being mindful of Christ as a good husband is of his wife and a good wife is of her husband. So consider our gospel, picture our gospel today. Pharisees are interrogating St. John the Baptist to see if he is the Christ, or, this might be more accurate, to see if he claims to be the Christ. They come to him, not out of sincere repentance, as do many of the others, but to find out how big a threat John poses to them. Like King Herod, the Pharisees are looking more for threats than they are for the Christ. They are more concerned that John, whoever he is, will disrupt their power over others than they are concerned that he might be the Christ, or that the Christ might come in their lifetime and begin his reign. Consider them. Look at them. Inflamed with anger, indignation, pride, a great sense of entitlement, the Pharisees ask John, Who do you think you are? As they are interrogating John, as they are consumed with these passions, Christ is there. Christ is standing right next to them, in their midst. But they don't see him because they aren't looking. They are not really looking for the Christ. They are not really looking for their Savior. They are confident in their own salvation. What do they need Christ for? They aren't looking for their king. They make the rules. They don't need a king. How long will they maintain this obstinacy? Read the Gospels. Christ stands in their midst now, but at least he hasn't begun his ministry yet. At least up until now, for the most part, our Lord has been everywhere unknown, almost everywhere. So we might excuse them in this moment, although, remember, they're inflamed with their passions and they're not really looking for Christ. They're really responding to threats. They've got their anger up and they're not paying attention. Where, where is Christ? Should we look for him? So again, we might excuse them now, though, for not knowing Christ, as the presuming St. John. But what is their excuse when he begins to preach and fill their ears with his heavenly teaching? When he teaches the truth with authority? What will be their excuse when he works miracle after miracle, proving, proving his divinity, proving that he is who he says he is? Some, like Nicodemus, at first incredulous, are converted and believe. But how many persevere in their obstinacy? How many go through the whole time? No. No, it doesn't matter what he says. It doesn't matter what miracles he works. They have their minds are like stone. And they make sure that he will stand unknown to them until the day he stands on the cross. Again, in their midst, but unknown to them, because of their anger, is their pride, because of their consumption with their passions. So much for the Pharisees. So much for the Jews. How are things now? Now, after the resurrection, which has been so well documented, after the growth of the church and all her saints and miracles have testified to her perfect teaching, does our Lord stand in our society unknown? Do you stand unknown in the state and in the public schools? Yes. Now again, would it have been different if God had not, would it not have been different if God hadn't proved his church through so many miracles, through our heavenly teaching, through the lives of so many saints, purified and made blessed, or the lives of so many other people just made good and decent? But having shown the church to be of divine origin, to be infallible, and Christ to be king over all, what is our society's excuse? So much for our society. More importantly, though, because we all like, it's fun to beat off on the Pharisees, it's fun to beat up on our secular society, it's easy to. 
More importantly, what is our own excuse? Does Christ ever stand unknown in our own soul, in our own lives? This is where cultivating that virtue of recollection or that habit of recollection is essential. Every time we sin, do we not turn a blind eye to Christ? How much better would our lives be if we remembered his presence always? He's promised to be with us always. He dwells in the soul of every Christian. We have but to remember him, to remember him standing there. Again, we can look at those Pharisees today like parts of our own soul, focused on one thing, letting giving free reign to our passions on anger or something else, focused over here, Christ is standing right there. But how do you do this? How do you keep, then, from forgetting something? It's really hard. And you say, I'm not going to forget. Well, if you weren't going to forget, you never never would forget. How do you keep from forgetting something? We can't spend every moment in church. I'm not saying that you ought to. Nor can we keep the center of our attention focused constantly on Christ or on God or anything. Like, it's not humanly possible, and you're not expected to. Oh no, Father Kluge said, if I don't, like, stay awake all the time, why knuckling it, I'm going to... No, not at all. How do we remember other things? This is where that example, the husband and a wife, I think, is very apt. Very apt, in a lot of ways. How does a husband, how does a good husband, remember his wife? Does he have to spend all of his time with her? Don't answer. Does he have to think constantly about her and think of nothing else? No. He has to live as if he's always her husband. You must never forget that he's married. When husbands or wives get caught up in their own concerns and start living as if they weren't married, with no thought to the other, like they're living their own separate life. We've got my job over here and my stuff, and my friends, blah, blah, blah. They're forgetting who they really are. Just like someone might go to Mass once a week, but forget our Lord the rest of the time. How do then, how do good husbands remember their wives and vice versa? Well, they do spend time with them. They have pictures of them at work. They build habits that preserve their presence, that reflect their state as married, and as married to that particular person. When big decisions need to be made, they consult the other one. They get in the habit of that. We get in the habits of our thinking. We get in the habits of like, oh, I'm just going to make, I just make decisions. I'm just going to do stuff. Married people, good married people, get in the habit of consulting with each other. I know the husband is the head, absolutely. But he still ought to consult with his wife, and all the more so, wife or husband. Seek each other out for guidance. And even in the smaller things. You know, how much time out should you get for saying that word? Well, let's be on the same page here. How else do good husbands and wives remember each other? In times of strife, times of difficulty with each other, they look to the past and to the future. When a wife is difficult and hard to be with, which applies to nobody here, a good husband will remember her good qualities, the good actions of the past, all her efforts and sacrifices, all the blessings that have come to him through her, and he will also look to the future, when times will be better, because they will be better when she or he will recover their former virtues and gain, or grow, gain new ones. The good spouse also creates firm, objective habits. Simple, everyday things. Like never being alone with a member of the opposite sex you aren't married to. Setting time aside for each other. Oh, I know, we've got to do this. We'll do it. Setting time aside for each other. Where am I? 
those habitual ways of showing affection. I say this not as a you know lesson in marriage or anything, um, or at least not directly. But again, look at that as as a pattern for how the good Christian soul can be recollected of its Lord, of her Lord. Just so the recon- recon- uh, recollected soul who wishes to remember Christ. The Christian makes habits. He identifies occasions of sin and avoids them. Builds those habits into his life. I know I shouldn't watch TV shows with this in it. So, whoosh, they're out. You know, I shouldn't do this, that, or that. Whoosh, it's gone. Conforming my life, these little things. Everything he watches, he reads, he listens to, he does as if Christ were by his side. Oh, should I watch this TV show? I don't know. What do you think? You know, it's not like you can't ever have fun or ever do anything enjoyable, but turn around. Hey, what do you think about that? Is that okay? Okay. Well, no? All right, I won't. Like the husband with his wife, the Christian keeps images of Christ and his mother around. <clears throat> we ought to have crosses in all of our rooms, as I'm sure you do. Um, images in our cars, these other things, and makes use of them. Good Christian makes use of the husband kind of wife picture his wife on his desk. And if he never looks at it, you know, if it doesn't act like it's there, God forbid. So we make use of those things. We make use of those things. Make use of those images to remind us. It's easy in church where everything reminds us of Christ. That's why we need those in our rooms, in our houses. Imagine to yourself now. Picture yourself, I'm in my living room. Do I know where the cross is instinctively? Can I picture it? It's right there. Or it's over there. Or I haven't pulled it up yet. I need to do that. The Christian who wishes to remember Christ, wishes to be recollected, just like the spouse, will take time every day with our Lord in prayer. This really is the most important. Take that time to speak to him about how your day is going, like you take time to speak to your spouse every day. When you get too busy, or a spouse is for Christ, you start ignoring them. We stop paying attention to them. We stop remembering them. So we take that time. Check in. Even if we don't feel like it, I'm tired. I'm irritable. All the more so. All the more reason. Talks to him throughout the day. You know, technology is great. I love technology. Yeah, I, I, good husband and wives, I'm sure, text, text, their, text each other. You know, hey, how you doing? How did that go? Etc. right? Well, do that with our Lord, too. All right, help me with this. I got this meeting coming up. Or I'm sitting in this meeting, and it's really boring. Or I'm sitting in something else, and it's really boring. Help me maintain myself here. Oh, there's that guy. You know that guy, God. Help me. Be patient. You talk to him. These little ways, little ways of talking to God throughout the day, keeping him close, just like we text with each other. Just as when there is trouble in marriage, Christian thinks about the past and the future when he has troubles in his life in the present. You find yourself beset by doubts, beset by these doubts of the faith, persecuting you, tearing you down, confusing you. Remember how much Christ has done for you. Go back into the past. Remember the veritable miracles that he's worked in your life. Just look at our Lord and the Pharisees. How often has our Lord proven himself in your own past, in all the sacraments you've received, in all the good things that have happened to you, in all the graces you've gotten? We get, just like with the family life, you know, we get trapped in the present sometimes, if the present is bad. And we need to look back. We need to remember the spouse, we need to remember Christ. We think of the future. We think of the promises that he's made. Think of our Blessed Mother Mary waiting for us. Remember those promises. God, the Christ will place the humble first. When you are overlooked now, insulted now, laughed at now, you remember past so was Christ and he reigns now. And so will he exalt the humble in heaven. Again, recollection is not that you must always be constantly thinking about Christ or that everything has to be 
you know, explicitly about Christ. You know, it's okay to play frisbee. It's okay to play board games and these other things, right? It's okay to do stuff that doesn't directly focus on Christ as long as he's there. As long as he's there. As long as we're not turning a blind eye to him like the Pharisees were. Just like with your husband or your wife. The husband must not forget who he is. The Christian must not forget who he is. There are storms in the world and in ourselves that tempt us both. We must make a habit of turning to Christ first in these storms. When troubles beset us from the outside, people yelling at us, all these other things, we have a bad spouse or whatever, or we think we do, they're loud and noisy. They're like the Pharisees interrogating John. Up in his face, who do you think you are? But well, what's John doing? John has eyes on Christ. John knows where Christ is. Looking right at him. He's right there. In, he's there he's, there's one here in your midst. You can picture him looking right at Christ. So he's not paying attention to what these Pharisees are yelling about. He's got eyes for Christ. That's when stuff comes at us from the outside. That's what we need to do too. Where's, all right, you guys step aside. Where's Christ here? Let me find him. All right, sh- be quiet, be quiet. Oh, where is he? Same thing for in ourselves, though, more importantly. When passion threatens to overtake us, desire, anger, sadness, when we feel like we're going to be flooded with a passion, then it's we who are like those Pharisees, flooded with their passions, with that anger that blinds them. Passions blind us. Blind us to reality, blind us to where Christ is. Christ is right next to them, and they can't see it because of their passions. So when you get all riled up about something, good, bad, or indifferent, or whatever, and it greatly disturbs you, look for Christ. Go before the crucifix. They help me. I can't think straight. I'm overcome with this emotion, with this, that, or the other thing. Look always for him. So, good Christian... Rejoice indeed. I know, you're like, God, it is Sunday. But think about this. Christ may stand unknown in many places and in the hearts of many Christians, quite unfortunately. But see how easy it is to remember him. And once he's remembered, once he is known, then he is possessed. You possess Christ simply by recollecting him, simply by directing your heart towards him. You possess him. And thus, you can possess Christ when you can possess nothing else. Now, this is where it differs from that analogy to marriage. Okay? You may be a perfectly good husband, you're not. You may be a perfectly good husband or a perfectly good wife, and you're probably not, for your part, and still be abandoned, and still be very badly treated, still have a bad, in objective sense, a troublesome marriage. You can do everything on your end, the other person not doing his part. It's going to cause problems. But it's not so with Christ. It's not so with Christ. Because if we do our part, he, we know he'll do his part. And so, the moment that we turn ourselves to Christ, instantly we possess him. Instantly. And those who practice these good habits, who have habits of recollection, keep our Lord close to him close to him throughout the day they possess him always and by possessing Christ they possess everything so rejoice rejoice it's so wonderful to take these times to see these make these do these little exercises to keep Christ close to us rejoice rejoice always says St. Paul joy is the possession of a good desire and you possess Christ Thus, there will be no trouble, no trial, no persecution, no punishment or abandonment in which you are still not able to rejoice. For what can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or famine or nakedness or danger or persecution or the sword? In all these things we overcome because of him that hath loved us, says St. Paul in the Romans. 
For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor might, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.